The information technology sector offers an awful lot of growth. On the other hand, value is hard to come by. Watch this video to see eight stocks in good value in the information technology sector. Hello, everybody. This is Chuck Carnival, co-founder of Fast Graphs, the Fundamentals Analyzer Software Tool, a.k.a. Mr. Valuation. Well, we've come to the end of our 11 video series on the various sectors, the various gig sectors from S Standard & Poor's. And this, I saved maybe the best for last, and that's the information technology sector. One thing about this sector, there's an awful lot of growth in this sector, and it's no mystery. Everybody knows that. As a consequence, it's very, very hard to find really good growth at really good values in the information technology sector. But we did find a few stocks, and I think foot the bill. We even found a couple that might be good for income investors. So let's go ahead and look at what we screened for in the information technology sector, looking for stocks that are trading at reasonable values. So I ran a screen, and I kept the screen pretty simple and pretty straightforward. And I come up with eight companies in the information technology general sector, IT consulting, technology distributors, communications equipment, electronic manufacturing, application software, two more technology distributors, and then Hewlett Packard, a hardware and storage peripherals. Now, what these companies offer is they offer various aspects. For example, on dividend yield, I do want you to note that Hewlett Packard and Cisco offer dividend yields over 3%, open tax at over 2.5%, TD Synex at 1.54, ScanSource pays no dividend, Flex Limited pays no dividend, and Plus, E Plus, Inc. pays no dividend. So we're going to look at these companies from the standpoint of finding value in the technology sector. And you're going to see there's a lot of similarities between these tech stocks, as you've seen similarities in every sector, not identical companies, but similar companies. All right, but I'm going to start. I'm going to go ahead and do this in alphabetic order because this makes it easier to go through the portfolio here. And we're going to start with Cisco. And most people are familiar with Cisco with their routers and so on. I'm going to do all these companies in 15 years. And I have a specific reason for that because that's a time when most of these companies you're going to see as I go through this were trading at undervalued. Now, just for you know, iteration of people not familiar with the website, fast graphs. The orange line on the graph is a plotting of earnings per share, and then we calculate the average growth rate from point A to point B. And then we apply a multiple based on formulas that are used, they're essentially discounted cash flow based formulas on how to identify fair value or intrinsic value or a reasonable value. Now, what that means is this is a valuation that if you invest in the stock at this level, then you are positioning yourself to fully participate in whatever kind of results the business generates. It's not about the stock price. It's about the value of the business. And then we put weekly closing stock prices and correlate to that. And then in very, really simplistic terms, if the price is below the orange line, those are you know, really favorable times to be investing. That means the stock is trading below its intrinsic value or at a very attractive valuation, even offering the all-important moderate margin of safety that value investors covered so much. When the stock gets above the orange line and looks like it's overvalued, those are usually not good times to enter the stock. And you can see the consequences of paying these high valuations and what happens over the next couple of years. Buying the stock at fair value usually gives you a good rate of return, you know, all along, even if the stock stays fairly valued and doesn't even get back to intrinsic value. You know, here's a time when Cisco would have offered you 15% annualized rate of return, including dividends, had you bought it when the stock was trading at a PE of 9.6 back in September 9th of 2011. All right, so valuation matters, and it matters a lot. But as you can see, Cisco has an average growth rate of about 6.71%. This used to be a much faster grower. Forecasting is for it only to grow at about 4%, but because it's trading at a discount to fair value, that would still give us the ability to make a double-digit rate of return if it traded at a 15 multiple. If it maintains the you know normal multiple it had in the last five years, it would even be up to 14%. 
So Cisco is a very attractive dividend-paying technology stalwart. It's double-A rated, has only 13% debt, an earnings yield of 7.68%, and a dividend yield of 38 This white line on the graph, again, for those who aren't aware of FastGraph, represents the dividend while it's part of earnings. And then this area here is stacked on top of the orange line, showing that the dividends have been paid to the shareholders. And if you point to the dots, you can see the payout ratios that the company's dividend represents based on its total earnings here. So the first one we have here is Cisco. Now, there are other metrics, since this is an income opportunity here. I also like to look at operating cash flow. And here, I'm not so much considered with correlating stock price. I'm more interested in looking to make sure that the cash flows, the orange line, are higher than the dividend, the white line, which means the dividends are real, you know, well covered by cash flows. And then, of course, the asset test would be free cash flow. And I like a company whose free cash flow and operating cash flow is significantly above the dividends. Now, I can look at other metrics with fast graphs, like, you know, price to sales and sales. And here you can see sales growth is only top line growth has been about 4%. But then if we put the price in here, once again, you see an average normal price to sales ratio has been about 3.4. The company currently trades at 3.7. So it's just slightly above that, or you might say fully valued based on a price to sales basis. So I would look at the companies in a lot of different ways. And, you know, I've had, you know, all kind of cynical comments on previous video I've done. I want to remind you, these videos are about identifying similar characteristics of each of the 11 sectors and then trying to give you some companies that look attractively valued in each of those sectors. These have not been fully researched at this level. I'm just giving you an opportunity to look for companies or maybe look into companies yourselves that, that might fit your investment objectives that you might find attractive. Cisco right now would be a double-digit return potential, 3.8% dividend yield, and an extremely high-quality AA-minus rated company with minimal amounts of debt. Okay, that would be the allure of Cisco. Going further, the next would be Amdocs Limited, Amdocs an IT consulting and other services firm. What's nice about this stock is the consistency of the growth. It's grown actually slightly faster than the S&P at about 8.46%. And you can see that growth has been very consistent. They did start paying a dividend, as you can see, in September of 2012. And the dividend has steadily increased each and every year. Currently, it offers 1.9%, which is a little better than the overall market. The earnings yield is 6.74, which is about my threshold. I like to see earnings yields higher than that. The company's triple B rated and only has 17.7% debt to capital. So extremely high quality company. And once again, we could look at some of these other metrics and see that operating cash flows and free cash flows both cover the dividend with a very nice margin on, you know, on top of that. All right. So looking at this company from an investment point of view, you can see the price has tracked earnings. Once again, when the price is below the orange line, it's a great time to buy. When it's above the orange line, those are not optimum times to buy. Here's a case where the company grew at its, you know, pretty much normal rates, but investors would have actually lost money over investing in it from July of 2015 through April of 2019. Almost four years there of not making any money because you would have overpaid for it. Had you bought it, you know, when it was more reasonably priced, and I, I didn't hit the same dates, you could have made like over 9%. Valuation matters, and it matters a lot. The stock was very undervalued when I first started this series. It's rallied a little bit. It's now trading at below a 15 PE, given it that 6.74% earnings yield. And again, you know, it's it, inexpensive. Looking at forecasting going forward, analysts expect double-digit growth, plus the dividend would give you a 12.5% return. And analysts have been spot on forecasting one year and two year forward on this company. So these forecasts look... You know, you could might want to you know argue that these forecasts might be very reasonable in Amdocs. Again, a very high quality company with low amount of debt. The next here would be Flex Limited. Flex Limited is I'm going to call it quasi cyclical. If I look at the normal multiple on this stock, the orange line would be theoretically the fair value of the stock. So again, when the price is below that line, it's is undervalued, but the market also has a say in stock prices. And the normal P.E. ratio is the valuation the market has 
applied over this 15-year time frame, which includes, by the way, some estimate data here. And that's been about a 10 multiple. So as you're analyzing this stock, and again, it pays no dividend, it has about 40% debt, it is triple B minus rated, has an earnings yield of 8%, but it's trading at a PE of 12.45, which is slightly above its, you know, his, the normal value the market has applied there. So for whatever reason, it's electronic manufacturing services. The market, you know, has a pension here to, in recent years of pricing this at a relatively low valuation. I would consider that if I was considering this stock. So when I'm looking at forecasting, I would immediately go to the normal multiple. And, you know, for the last five years, it's been 9.91, which is essentially 10. And that would indicate that the stock is moderately overvalued, but it does have um, double digit expectations of growth. So if you were able to get it back at a reasonable multiple of, let's say, 10 or below, then, you know, you might want to take a look at this stock right now. I would say that you're not going to fully participate in the growth of the company, but you'd probably still make money buying Flex Limited. The next stock on the list is HPE. This is purely an income vehicle. This stock is moderately cyclical, in my opinion. Again, it trades at a discounted valuation of about an eight multiple over the last several years. It's trading at a seven multiple now, has a very high earnings yield and a very high dividend yield and a good dividend record. They haven't grown the dividend, but the dividend, ha they've maintained the dividend ever since they started paying one in you know, 2016. Now, you can go into our performance section and compare the performance of HPE versus the S&P 500, and this is without reinvesting dividends, okay? And the point being is, this stock is currently undervalued, where the S&P 500 is actually overvalued. I wanna make that clear, there's an advantage to the S&P 500 right now. But if you look at performance, the performance has been very, very similar to the S&P. Growth has been 7.65 versus 10.5 in the S&P, but it did pay a thousand more than a thousand dollars in dividends. Now, if I reinvest those dividends, then it does close the gap a little bit, but the S&P still has outperformed it. Now, the point of that is this isn't a company you invest in to outperform the S&P on total return. This is a company you invest in because it's triple B rated, has less than 25% debt, and offers a 3.4% dividend yield. So this would be primarily attractive for the income that it produces. If you want to have a nice high quality, you know, name, iconic name like Hewlett Packard in your portfolio as an income vehicle, if I would, if I was that kind of investor, that's what I'd be looking at it for. The next is Open Text Corporation. Now this is a Canadian based company. It's application software. It's expected to grow very fast in fiscal 2024, and it has a June fiscal year, just to be clear here. And you can see that on the fast graph. It pays about 2.5% dividend. The dividend has grown consistently since they started paying one back in 2013. And incidentally, I might point out that, you know, information technology sector hasn't really been known for its dividends until more recently, maybe the last decade or so. And you can see these companies, you know, in 2012 and 11, it did not pay a dividend, and it paid a very modest dividend in 2013, and it still has a payout ratio of, you know, 18 to 20 percent-ish. There's 26 percent. The payout ratio is getting a little higher as growth kind of slows down. They are expected to have an explosive year this year. The forecasting calculator expects about a 10 percent average, but that's made up of 47 percent this year followed by five and a half and 3.7. The long-term growth rate is not given on this company. And if you look at the analyst scorecard, they have an excellent analyst scorecard. They've either met or beat analyst estimates 100% of the time. They've actually beat it 33% of the time on a one-year forward and 17% of the time on a two-year forward with a 20% margin of error. So this looks like a very attractive entry point. The stock looks really undervalued at this level, even based on its normal PE, which is slightly below, you know, the 15.5 that is drawn on this graph with the orange line and the, the blue line is 13.71. But again, I want you to focus on the consistency of the growth of most of these companies, maybe with the exception of Hewlett Packard that I showed you. Now, the next one is a non-dividend paying stock, E plus Inc., it's a technology distributor, 
has a very nice earnings yield, but again, it is typically traded at a low multiple of around 13. It's slightly above that right now. Forecasting growth is 7.76%, which is average or slightly above average, so it would be fairly priced at that point. But, you know, based on the normal PE, it would actually look like it's slightly underpriced, although this stock has outperformed the market since, you know, this 15-year time frame. Primarily, I think, because the company was undervalued and did grow at over 18%. has an earnings yield of 6.8%, no dividend yield, and a very minimal debt level of only 1.08%. So that's one of the attractiveness of a lot of these tech stocks I'm showing you here. The next one is ScanSource. Now, ScanSource, I wanted to show this because it's a consistent performer, but it does obviously have cyclicality. Even if I go to the max time frame here, you'll see that it goes periods of growth followed by you know cyclicality, relatively flat growth here. Keep looking at it on the apples to apples version. It had 5.78% growth, but that was, you know, basically exceeded because of that one year. It's really been only been about a 3% growth. It did have trouble during COVID, but it stayed profitable. I want to make that clear. And then it recovered very strongly to kind of go back on track. But this company pays no dividends. The forecast for this stock is to grow to about 7.8%. The normal multiple on this stock would indicate it would be fairly valued. I wanted to show this kind of company because even though there's a lot of similarities between stocks in the same sector, not all of them are big, fast, high-growing stocks. Okay, the next stock on the list here is Synex, TD Synex. It's been a double-digit grower at 15%. It's traded at a historically at about an 11 multiple over time. It's currently trading below that at nine. It has a 1.54% dividend yield, triple B rated with debt slightly exceeding 25% to capital. You know, forecasting for this company is for about 8% growth going forward. The stock is very undervalued on a intrinsic value basis, but on a normal PE basis, how the market has been valuing the stock, it's fairly valued, but it would still give you the potential for double digit returns with a very high quality company, investment grade credit rating with very low debt. And, you know, it has had periods where its growth has flattened and then accelerated again. Again, this might be worth, you know, spending some time doing a little research on. So these are info technology stocks, I should say, information technology stocks that are fairly valued and attractively valued. But as you all know, technology has been a very, very hot sector for the last you know decade or so. And as a result, most tech stocks are trading at very, very high multiples. And so what I did was I created an additional portfolio, and I included in here three of the Magnificent Seven, Apple, Microsoft, and NVIDIA. And these are stocks whose P.E. ratios, you know, the lowest valued stock on here is Apple with a 29 P.E. all the way up to a 69 P.E. for ServiceNow Corporation, 68.93. Okay, now, they do have earnings growth in the double-digit range. Apple, incidentally, is only expected to grow at about 8%, and we'll, we'll examine that. The reason I did this kind of as a bonus here, because I wanted you to basically see that these are some of the highest quality companies in the world. They're all A-rated or better. Of course, we got AAA rated Microsoft, AA rated Apple. I actually think Microsoft is down to AA plus now, so that could be just a little blip in the data. But anyway, regardless, these are all very, very high quality companies. Microsoft still may be AAA. I may be just be dreaming that. But I'm going to go through these again in alphabetical order, and we're going to start with Apple. And what I want you to understand is this. When you're looking at these stocks with very high multiples and very high growth rates, now Apple's historical growth rate long term has been very, very high, but you can see some very high numbers here coming into the recession of 08 and 09. If I go to that 15 year time frame that we've been looking at, you can see that Apple's growth has slowed down to about 14.8%, and that still includes a 60% year and a 43% year. But more recently, if I drop this, like, say, to a nine-year growth rate, then we see that we're, you know, down to about 14% growth. Going forward, analysts are expecting 9% growth going forward. The long-term growth of Apple is expected to be about 11%. Now, the reason I mention that is because the company is still going to grow. But the point is, what price are you as an investor willing to pay. If you could have bought this stock at a 15 multiple, and I want you to note you could have, 
in 2018, if I run this out to the 15 years, you could have bought this stock at 15 times earnings from 2011 all the way through 2019. That would have been, those numbers would have been a great entry point. The problem now is, even though the company is still expected to grow, and even though the company is an extremely high quality company with you know oodles of cash on their balance sheet, some of it even hidden according to some sources, the stock has now become fully valued. I don't think this is a good entry point to be entering Apple. If you own the stock, should you sell it now? I think there's a risk of holding it now going forward. If you look at the forecast, if it grows at 9%, you know, it could generate a negative rate of return over the next three years. But then beyond that, it could be, you know, begin being positive again. You know, you could pare back on Apple a little bit. Note that when Apple got pretty highly valued here in 2021, we had a year where, you know, the stock did have a rather, I'm going to say rather severe correction of just about 25%. Okay, the, the, you know, that was a drawdown, if you will, but then it's recovered. But the point is that you know, I want you to notice a couple of things. The stock has actually become more volatile when it's highly valued, and it's very, very difficult. And I want to remind you again, the whole idea of fair value, of being a value investor, is to find and identify companies you really love. I love Apple. I think it's maybe one of the best, if not the best company in the world. But I'm only willing to pay a price that allows me to participate in the benefits that the company can give me. Overpaying for it defeats that purpose, in my opinion. Now, the same would be true of a company like Adobe, and Adobe's a little different picture here. I want you to see that we had, you know, double-digit growth. If I look at forecasting, we're still expecting double-digit growth for Adobe, and we've got an analyst scorecard that is pretty good. You know, they did miss earnings 17% on the two-year and the one-year, but that's a pretty good scorecard all in all. You know, it's certainly a B-rated scorecard, if not an A-rated, like some of the ones I showed previously, but you can see the high multiple the market has been applying to this stock. You could have bought it, by the way, at about a 16 multiple or even a 12 and 13 multiple back in 2012. This allows you to fully participate in the growth of the business. And when the market then gives you the benefit or the bonus of high valuations like this, you participate. Now, once again, note when the valuation got exceedingly high, when we got a PE in the 50s, we saw this significant drawdown of the stock, and it's now recovered again. But we are paying 36 times earnings, and the earnings yield is only 2.7%. Now, what does that mean? That means that if this company paid you 100% of their profits to you, if you owned 100% of the company, your return annually would be 2.7%. Hardly something to get excited about. It is A-plus rated and does have less than 20% debt. Adobe, again, an excellent company. I just don't think this is a good entry point. Microsoft, the almighty Microsoft, it is still AAA rated. I don't know why I was thinking it wasn't, but it is. I want you to know you could have bought Microsoft at below a 15 multiple back in 2012 and 13. Now, growth was stalled back then. We didn't have much growth, and that lasted for four or five years. And then all of a sudden, Microsoft start growing. That's the one thing about tech stocks. Growth can come in spurts, but it can also flatten out. And when it does, you know, it's going to be more difficult to make money in the short run, but it's also a better time to enter. But again, you see extremely high valuation drop. The stock is now trading at 36 times earnings, only offers a 2.7% earnings yield, offers a dividend yield less than 1%, but it is AAA rated with only 22% debt. Going forward, it's expected to grow at double-digit rates, and long-term growth in this case is expected to be double-digit rates. But it has to maintain a very high multiple for you to make money at you know that growth rate and at this valuation. That's the point I want to make. Value matters, and it matters a lot. Now, if I owned Microsoft today, I did own this stock. I sold it when it got overvalued. I made a lot of money in it. I left some money on the table, admittedly. But right now, I don't consider this a good entry point. Now, ServiceNow is another example of that. The market has put, you know, an unbelievably high, you know, valuation on this stock since it's been public. You know, if I shorten the time frame, it's still trading at a 90 multiple. It's currently trading at a 68 multiple. The company has grown at 37%. It is expected to grow at 22% going forward. And the long-term growth on this company is expected to exceed 30%. 
So, you know, there's a lot of growth here, but you're paying a very high price to buy that growth. Earnings yield's only 1.45%, and there's no dividend yet. And I do believe growth, you know, is slowing down. You can just see that by eyeballing the bottom of the graph here and see the growth rates are beginning to slow down. And that's normal for a company that's, you know, it's now $149 billion in market cap. The next is NVIDIA. Now, there's an exception to every role. This is, you know, the AI king. Now, what's happened with NVIDIA, if you look at this from the max chart, I think there's a lot to learn here. You know, the company, if I, you know, use my scroll feature here and take out these recent years of high growth, in fact, if I go to just before COVID, actually, I need to go couple years before that. This company has been about a 19 or 20 percent grower. You know, take another couple of years off of that. Let me try to do it if I can. All of a sudden, growth has exploded. And then for the last couple of years, it's really exploded. So the stock was overvalued in 2022 based on, you know, a P.E. ratio of 30 here being fair value. It's just a maximum you'd ever want to pay. It was trading at a P.E. of 80 times earnings. It's currently trading at a P.E. of 47 times earnings. But look at the growth that's expected for 2024, 2025, and 2026. If I go to the forecasting calculator, we're looking at 40% growth out to 2026. So you could still make a double-digit rate of return buying NVIDIA today, and that would be including some P.E. ratio contraction. If it's still traded at a 47 multiple, you know, you could make over 40% a year. And, you know, if I look at the normal multiple has been 40 over, you know, recent times. So this could be a 45% generator. But I want you to understand that that's a very, very high hurdle. But you can see that what's happened to NVIDIA stock actually makes sense from a fundamental point of view. It's A plus rated with 21% debt, a minuscule dividend, not even worth talking about. A very, very low earnings yield, but in this case, we've got a lot of growth going forward. And so that's something you'd want to take into consideration. So these are, you know, five. And this and NVIDIA, of course, is one of the MAG7. Apple's one, the other one, and Microsoft's the other one. But I wanted to illustrate the contrast here between fairly valued information technology stocks versus very fast-growing, very powerful, high-quality stocks but that are trading at premium valuations today. Anyway, this has been Chuck Carnival, co-founder of FastGraphs, the Fundamentals Analyzer software tool, finally finishing the 11 stock series. I'm going to be showing some stocks that I think look attractive coming into 2024 in future videos. By the way, FastGraphs is coming out with a lot of new features very, very soon that are really going to be I think, um, exciting for you, including a better way to sh illustrate performance, be able to compare the performance of one company to the next, not in addition to just looking at the stock market. Um, we're also going to have some stuff going on in our portfolio section that's going to, as a good old friend of mine from Colorado used to say, knock your hat in a crick. Anyway, thanks for watching. If you liked the video, give me a like, subscribe to the channel.